Christ, and he only got to FAI. So never got to the TH part. So, um, but anyway, this one's a little bit different. And in fact, you can see up here, it has five questions that you can ask. And these, if you're taking notes, um, if you don't have the app and you want to write these down, um, I would encourage you to. Um, these are good questions to ask someone if you get into that conversation, you know, and you want to uh, share the gospel. So let me ask you this. Do, how many of you, and I really want this to be interactive, so I want your feedback as much as possible. How many of you, um, uh, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you think you know someone that you interact with on a pretty regular basis that you believe is lost, but you're afraid to share the gospel with them? Again, you don't have to raise your hand, but it's okay if you do, okay? And um, is, is this somebody, and you don't have to answer this unless you want to, but is it someone that you work with? Is it possibly a family member or a friend or like a neighbor, something like that? Co-worker? Yeah, co-workers. I work with over 500 people. I assure you I have co-workers that are lost. And, in fact, I know of one. I, I witnessed to one um, just a couple months ago and uh, that, that is, that's definitely lost. And, uh, but there were, some, there were some positive to that conversation. So what holds you back? What are things that you can think of that maybe holds you back that might make you feel like you shouldn't share the gospel? Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, the depth at which they have studied their beliefs. You know, as Christians, we need to know what our faith is, right? We need to know what our faith is in. We have to be confident in that. And if you want to share the gospel with people, you have to be confident in what you believe. You have to be at least as confident in what you believe as they are in what they believe. Okay? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. What she said was uh, a lot of people just don't believe in anything. And that is true. I, and I will tell you, I, I, uh, um, a family member of mine, um, and I, I won't say who, but not a, not a, it's not my, one of my brothers, but if a family member of mine, um, I had the opportunity to sit down and spend a couple hours with him um, a couple years ago. And I had never been able to have a conversation like this with him, but I knew he was lost. I, he's still lost today. And I, my, I know my dad has witnessed to him. And I wanted to um, say something. And I wasn't sure what to say. And so as we're talking about other things, I'm trying to steer the, the conversation in that direction. And I finally asked the question, I said, and I told him, I said, I said, look, I don't want you to think I'm forcing my views on you. And he knows what I believe. I said, I don't want you to think I'm forcing my views on you. I said, but I honestly value your opinion on this. And I, I said, do you mind if I ask you a, a question? And he, he said, no, yeah, go ahead. And I said, what do you believe happens to a person when they die? And his response was, in fact, he kind of leaned forward. He goes, honestly, Robert, nothing. I just think that's it. I just think, you, I just think they're gone. It's that, that, that's it. They're done. That's final. And my response was, I said, you know, you might be right. You could be right. I said, but, I mean, you know what I believe. And I said, one of the reasons I believe what I believe is it has the least amount of risk. 
Because if I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. But if you're wrong, you've lost everything. And I said that primarily because I felt like that's what the Spirit was leading me to say because I believe it was something that would resonate with him. Now, did it was a seed planted? I, I can't say for certain. You know, only the Spirit of God would know that. But just like you said, he just believes that there's there is no life after death. Now, this lady that I was sharing the gospel with at work uh, a couple months ago, she does believe in a spirit world. So that's that's a good thing. Now, she grew up uh, in a Catholic boarding school. And so she doesn't have a real high opinion of religion. And I'm not saying it's the Catholic's fault in general, but I'm just saying she, her experiences as a child has given her a bad, uh, bad opinion of religion in general. And she shared that, you know. But when, when you encounter these people and you feel like the Spirit of God is talking to you, that's when you probably start to feel that, that anxiety and that fear about saying something. You know, and, and I've witnessed this many times. I, over time, I've gotten more and more bold about sharing the gospel. And... Um, a lot of it's because I guess I've just gotten to the point I don't really care if people like me or not. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if you know, you, you said fear of rejection. Well, you can reject me if you want to. That's fine. You know, I've gotten to where, and I probably shouldn't say this publicly. I don't know if we're, are we streaming online? We are streaming online? Okay. I probably shouldn't even say this. But a lot of times in a job, if I'm interviewing an employee or a potential employee, a lot of times I just ask them, do you know Jesus? Because around here, we talk about Jesus all the time. And, you know, there's a lot of people that work at Colin and Carney that are faithful. Um, I send out a daily devotional to about 125 people every day. Um, and that's people that asked to, re to receive it. So every day I pull it off of billygram.org and I just paste it into an email and send it out to an email list of 125 people. And, you know, I offer to pray with people. I offer to pray with departments sometimes don't get a lot of takers, you know, but um, I'm still going to talk about it. And um, it 20 years ago, I wasn't that way. But 20 years ago, I cared a whole lot more about what people thought about me. And now I just don't, I just don't care as much. And I think it's given me some boldness about sharing the gospel. If somebody's, well, I'll tell you this. Tell you this, how many of you knew Brother Paul Magnus? Brother Paul Magnus told me one time, he said, Robert, he said, you know how you defend the Bible? He said, you, the same way you would defend a lion. Just let it out of its cage, it'll defend itself. And that really, you know, he said a number of things that really stuck with me, and that was one of them. And I've thought about that so many times. If God's word is offensive to someone, that's between them and God. You shouldn't be bothered by it. You shouldn't let it bother you. God's word is going to offend some people, some unbelievers, and even in some cases it may offend some believers. You know? So I encourage you to, you know, be bold about sharing the gospel. And I'm hoping as we kind of go through some of this tonight that, that your confidence will, will increase. Let me ask this question. What does a person have to believe to be saved? Somebody tell me in your own words, what is the gospel? Who wants to take a shot at that? Yeah, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, for us to be saved, to go to heaven, right? Do what? And that he was resurrected, yeah. And that he's alive today. 
right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I I think if if you go to if you go to go ahead and open your Bibles. Let's go real quickly to Acts chapter ten. And the reason I want to go to Acts chapter ten is, um, if you look at verse thirty four, there my this new living translation has a little sub, little subtitle there says Gentiles hear the good news. Now, if you've been coming to Tim's Monday Bible, Monday or Wednesday Bible study, going through the book of Acts, he's already been through Acts chapter ten. This is where Peter Peter receives a vision. Now, it's against the law, Mosaic law for for the Jews to go to the house of a Gentile, okay? And they're still operating under though, though some of those laws. They still don't understand that, you know, things are changing and that um, uh, God's about to bring the Gentiles into the program. And this is actually the first point in Scripture where after the cross, God decides to send the gospel to the Gentiles. And I want to read through this real quickly because I want you to see what Peter says to these Gentiles. And this, again, he, he only goes because, you remember, he, he was on a rooftop, received a vision uh, of animals on a sheet that, he, that under the law he was forbidden to, uh, from eating. And he was told that, you know, Cornelius is going to send some men, men to you go with him, and he took some other, uh, some, some of the other brothers with him. So he didn't go by himself, as we'll see in here. But if we look real quick at when Peter spoke to the house of Cornelius, so he's speaking to Gentiles, he says, I see very clearly, verse 34, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Because Israel obviously wasn't in a state of peace with God, right? At this particular point in time, they were as a nation, they were not in a state of peace with God. They had actually just murdered uh, um, Jesus, which was all part of God's plan. But still, they were not in a state of peace with God at this at this point in time. But he he references that that the, the good news for the people of Israel is that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Gal Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism, and you know that the God uh, um, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses." We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. Okay? He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. All right? And then you, I won't read the rest, but uh, verse 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening. So jump over to Ephesians real quick, chapter 1. And verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own 
by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. So yeah, believing in Christ is crucial, is it not? But believing what? What does a person have to believe? The first thing that I believe a person has to believe is that they're lost. Brother Paul said one time, you can't get a person, you got to get them lost before you can get them saved. A person has to understand that they're a sinner, that they're a sinner not because they've chosen to sin, but because they adopted it or they, they inherited it. And that because of that, they're separated for eternity from God. And that's going to be a challenge with some people. Because I've heard the argument, well, I don't want to have anything to do with your God that would send a perfectly good person to hell. If it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have a choice. Right? We wouldn't even have a choice if Jesus hadn't gone to the cross. So a person has to believe that they're lost. They have to believe in life after death. And so some of these questions up here on the screen, you can see, will help you identify what a person believes. So if you look at that first question, do you have any kind of spiritual belief? You know, the, I mentioned sharing the gospel with a lady at work a, few month, a couple months ago, and she said, I believe in the spirit world. I don't believe in hell, but I believe in the spirit world. Okay, well, that's good. That's something to work with. And, you know, I didn't feel like when I walked in and sat down to talk to her that, that I would necessarily, um, you know, get a profession of faith out of her. But so often, we're just planting seeds, right? Planting seeds, and we don't know when those seeds are going to sprout and flourish. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's not coming from us. Right. Right. Yeah, it's not coming from us. You're right. Yeah. And that's getting tougher and tougher. And what he was saying, he's saying is it's not easy getting people lost. And that's true, especially in today's world. Some self-righteousness is running rampant in our society, is it not? And so, yeah, it's difficult to get people lost. But it's not our job to do that. It's our job to communicate the message. It's the Spirit of God that will move upon that person. Now, let me share something else with you. If the Spirit of God's not moving in that person's heart, it's not going to happen. It's not, it will not happen. It's impossible. A required component of salvation is conviction from the Spirit of God. Okay? So that's something, that's something to keep in mind. But, you know, number two, to you, who is Jesus? Because you have to believe in Jesus, right? You know, what's, Martin can quote Romans 10, 9. If you confess, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe in your heart. What's the difference in your heart, your cardia versus your mind or your soul? What's the difference? I can have an intellectual belief, but if it's not a heart belief, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yep. They think works will get them there. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So, do you believe there is a heaven and a hell? That's kind of part of getting somebody lost. You know, if 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 a person doesn't believe in life after death, if a person doesn't believe that, you know, my sin 
well, that there is a, that there is a one true living God and that he sent his son to die on the cross to atone for sins because we, were, we are incapable of doing that. And, that. and believing in what he did is what gives you the gift of salvation. Uh, but in order to get a person to that point, they have to believe that, hey, there's, there's a destination that I don't want to go to. And that's part of getting a person lost. If they don't believe in a hell, then it, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult. I still don't shy away from sharing the gospel with them. I'm still going to tell them what I believe. Unless they don't just that flat out don't want to hear it. Sometimes they probably get it when they don't want to hear it. But if they don't tell me, <laughs> again, I'm going to keep talking. So number four, if you died right now, where would you go? You know, that's kind of similar to the, the key question in the faith evangelism training is, you know, in your understanding, you know, in your opinion, what do you believe happens to a person when they die? And I think that's, I think that's really critical, a uh, really critical component. A person has to understand that. And, and I know, look, I know this is basic, but it's something you got to think about because you're, you're sharing this with somebody that doesn't believe these things. And the goal is to help them understand. And this will be completely foreign to some people, completely new, something that they've possibly never heard. You know how many people believe that they're Christians just because they have faith in something? There is a past, I mean, not, there is a, an instructor at the University of Texas that believes he is a Christian, calls himself a Christian because he has faith in humanity. He says this publicly, I'm a Christian because I have faith. Yeah, which is not what the Bible says, is it? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through me. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, if you died right now, where would you go? And then if what you believe were not true, would you want to know it? And I like these questions because I, 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 I really like it better than, than, than faith because I feel like it give, it'll give you a little bit more insight into what, what a person believes and help you determine it if you should share the gospel. Now, sometimes you may share the gospel with, with someone, they're already a Christian, but they may give you a works answer, what we would call a works answer. You know, I just believe in, maybe in the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and, or I believe in keeping the, keeping the Ten Commandments is one I've heard before, you know. And, you know, there, there's, there's always the works com component of that. What would be your response to that? If somebody gives you a works type answer, what what can somebody think of a good response to that? Absolutely, Ephesians two eight and nine. You know, there's only I, I tell you, there's only a handful of verses that I think a person really should memorize. To and, and that's the next slide. Greg, do you want to put the next slide up there? Yeah, the and I, honestly. If you just memorize the first five, I think the first five is sufficient to share the gospel with someone. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is critical because for by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, and I'm missing part of it here, so that no one may boast about it. So in other words, grace is a gift that we receive because of placing our faith in the work that Jesus did. So the work involved is what he did. Now let me ask you this question. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that God raised him from the dead, does it matter if you believe that you can lose that salvation? I believe it does. I believe it does matter. I don't believe you, 
I don't believe you can. And in fact, I believe we read that in Ephesians. If you if you look at uh, like the New American Standard translation of Ephesians one thirteen, it, you know, it says the point at which you heard the word, the gospel of your uh, salvation, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You have to understand, and I look at this from a modular perspective, we're made up in three parts, mind, spirit, and soul, okay? I mean, I mean body. My, mind is the soul and then spirit and body. At the point of salvation, at the point at which you receive the Holy Spirit, what changes in you? Does your body change? No. Does your mind change? Not immediately. It begins to change. What changes is your spirit. You know, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but like First Thessalonians 5.23 says, I pray that you be wholly sanctified, mind, body, and spirit. Um, Philippians 1.6, which you've heard me quote, you'll hear me quote again. Um, that's my life verse he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. There's three components to that. He began that work by sanctifying my spirit. He will be faithful to complete it. He's working out the process of sanctifying my mind or changing the way I think, instilling Christ, the mind of Christ to replace the mind of Robert, which is not a good one. And then uh, on the day of Christ Jesus, I get a new glorified body, and then I'm holy. I'm, I'm complete. It's a finished product at that point. And he does it all. I, I have no part in it. Now, I believe that a person needs to believe in the all-sufficiency of the cross to be saved. I believe that a person has to understand that I bring nothing to the table. There's nothing, I can't be good enough. I can't add something to it. I can't take something away from it. I have to believe 100% of the work necessary to create the gift of salvation came from what Jesus Christ did on the cross. I do nothing else. It was, a, it, it was atonement for sin. It was a sacrifice. His blood was was a sacrifice. If you go back to the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices. In fact, there was a beautiful picture around here somewhere. I don't remember. Maybe it's out in the lobby that shows the, the, the courtyard and the tabernacle and all. And they had, the, they had the altar where they sacrificed animal after animal after animal after animal after animal all day long. It was a bloodbath. But they would sacrifice one animal for one person. That's why when somebody would bring a goat to the priest, they would put their hand on it to transfer the guilt to the goat so the goat could be the substitutionary sacrifice. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. He was the substitutionary sacrifice so we didn't have to die. He did that for us. The trick with with sacrifices in the Old Testament was the, the blood that was shed to atone for a sin had to be good enough to atone for the sin. Well, what could possibly be good enough to atone for all sin, for all man, for all time? The blood of our God in heaven in human form with no sin accredited to him. That's what it took, and that's what Jesus did. And I believe that's what a person has to believe to be saved. Now, do they have to understand all those intricate details? No, they don't. But the thing is, it's a matter of faith. And when you start to share the gospel with someone and you talk about the fact that you know, I believe that the only way to heaven, according to the Bible, is through Jesus, by believing in Jesus, because the Bible says there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. Now, I'm not quoting Scripture to tell someone this, but that's what the Bible says. 
and we add nothing to it. I can't work, I can't be good enough to get to heaven. So, and these verses of Scripture will certainly help you communicate that to someone. So if you'll just memorize those first five uh, li listings up there, um, then you really have all the main tools that you need. So go, go to the next one, Greg, because I'm not going to sit here and go through all these tonight. We don't, we don't really have the time. Now, if you, if you share the gospel, how many of you have shared the gospel before? Let me see your hands again. Hey, um, when you're sharing the gospel with someone, those of you that have done this, do you, um, can, can you usually tell if the person is receptive to what you're saying, if they're eager to hear more, if they're interested? That's something I look for when I'm talking to someone. Are they, are they even interested? Are they totally tuned out? Do they want to argue? My... My response, if they want to argue, hey, how's the fishing? Something I learned from Brother Paul. How's the fishing? In other words, you can't argue anybody to salvation. And someone that just wants to argue, it's a really good indication that the Spirit of God's probably not moving upon that person anyway. So, but here's the thing about sharing the gospel. The more and more you do it, the better you get. I'll tell you something else. <laughs> that, yeah, it came from Brother Paul. Okay, it did come from Brother Paul. I, I used to spend a lot of time with Brother Paul. I guess that's why I remember so much. But Brother Paul said one time, you know, if you go down I-30 towards Dallas, you know where I-30 crosses Anderson Creek? Big, long bridge. There's before you get to 259, you're crossing Anderson Creek, which feeds into Sulphur River uh, about 10 miles out from Overcup. And Brother Paul said, you know, if I'm driving towards Dallas and I look up ahead and I notice that the bridge over Anderson Creek has collapsed, so I pull over on the side of the road and I get out of my car and I see other cars coming that aren't paying attention, what am I going to do? What would you do? Flag them down. Why? It's important. You don't want them to die. Well, if you know they're lost, why aren't you flagging them down? What's more important? Is the life in this body as important as your spiritual life? Your spiritual life determines your eternal destiny. You're going to die in this body. It's going to happen. We all do. It's not optional. We have to have the boldness to tell people the bridge is out. And it's up to us. There's nobody else to do it, especially in the world we live in today. We have to have the boldness to tell people. And that's what I liked about the video series we did this summer. I thought that he did a really good job of encouraging people to share the gospel, to tell someone, tell someone, tell someone the bridge is out. You know, if you get to that point, if you sense that a person is responsive or, or interested and you feel like the Spirit of God may be moving upon that person, then you can proceed into these, this series of questions. Do you believe you're a sinner? Are you a sinner? Because that's critical. A person has to believe they're a sinner. They have to believe that that sin separates them from God. So are you a sinner? Do you want forgiveness for your sins? You'd be surprised. Some people, some people aren't going to be that concerned with it. They're really not going to be that concerned with it. Some people don't spend any time thinking about life after death and what's going to happen to me if I don't change or if something doesn't change in me. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross and rose uh, for you and rose again? That's critical. Again, Romans 10, 9. That we have to believe that. Are you willing to surrender your life to Christ? And then are you ready to invite Jesus into your heart? I'm sorry, into your life and into your heart. And then if you have the app, if you'll look at it, 
on the witnessing, witnessing plan, at the bottom it has a little salvation prayer that you can, you know, if, if you need a little guidance with, with uh, you know, leading them through a salvation prayer. And then you've got something to celebrate. And we used to do that in faith. I mean, we, the faith training, we would meet, we would uh, plan our visits, we would go conduct our visits, and then we would come back and celebrate the same night. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of nights we would go do visits. I'm sure seeds were planted, but a lot of nights, you know, we didn't have professions of faith, but we came back and we still celebrated. We would celebrate just the fact if somebody was interested in asking more questions. Can you tell me more about it? I don't really understand, but I'd like to learn more. Oh, absolutely. Be glad to. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. Somebody mentioned earlier that um, I worry about what questions they might ask that I can't answer. Don't worry about answering all their questions. Don't worry about that. My response a lot of times when somebody just wants to keep asking question after question after question, I may answer some of their questions, but then I just guide them back to the fact that, look, salvation is based on faith. If you're looking for evidence, you're not going to find enough to satisfy you. I'm not saying there isn't evidence, but if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to find salvation. It's based on faith. If people want to argue and say, well, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. Okay, so you've put your faith in the Big Bang Theory. Because the reality is, you don't really know that the Big Bang Theory occurred. And if it did, where did that big mass come from that exploded? You know, when people say, well, I believe in science. Okay, well, if science contradicts Scripture, then there's something wrong with your science. Plain and simple. And if you believe in science and you, don't, you can't believe that there's a greater being than us, let me ask you this question. If you take off in a spaceship that has an unlimited fuel supply, can fly at any speed, a thousand times the speed of light, that it has an automatic navigation system to keep you from flying into a star or a meteor or something, and you just set a course in one direction and you take off and fly past every star that's in space, what do you get to? What's at the end of space? Is there a wall? If so, what's it made of? How thick is it? What's on the other side of that wall? It's just more space, more stars. It just keeps going and going and going. What about time? When did time begin? When does it end? It's real easy to pull somebody out of the little box of reasoning ability that we have and to show them that, you know, there are things we can't explain. And, but whatever you've put, whatever you believe in, you're probably believing it on faith. Whether it's the Big Bang Theory or the theory of evolution or, or the fact that there's one true living God that sent his son to die on a cross to save us of our sins so we could spend eternity in heaven with God. And back to what I mentioned early on that I said to a family member, my belief has the least amount of risk. And that will resonate with some people. has the least amount of risk. Tim, we do a lot of risk management at work, don't we? All the time. Looking for risk. How do, how do we hedge this risk? Right, Dalen? All about hedging risk, isn't it? And money management. And in business, you're just constantly looking for risk. That will resonate with a lot of people that don't understand the gospel. If you can get them to thinking about life after death, you've got something to work with. So go, go on to the next slide. I put, and again, y'all, this is a crash course because this is something that really we ought to, ought to take, you know, several weeks to go through all of this. I put together just a simple list of do's and don'ts if you're taking notes and you want to write this down. Pray and listen to the Spirit. Don't go into sharing the gospel with somebody thinking that 
I'm going to, I'm going to win someone to Christ today. I'm going to show everybody around that I can share the gospel, that I can lead people to Christ. It ain't about you. It ain't about you. Pray and listen to the Spirit. Don't even bother if the Spirit of God's not leading you to say something to that person. I've made that mistake. And don't tell, the, don't tell any of the stories either. <laughs> and prepare yourself. You know, answering questions. The more you read the Bible, the stronger you are in your faith. Right, Ronald? We have to be strong in our faith to share our faith with someone else. We need to be at least as strong in our faith as they are in theirs. And you get there by reading God's Word. You don't get there by going home and turning on the TV. You don't get there going home and worried about chores around the house, getting ready for work tomorrow, etc. You go, you've got to get into the Word to prepare yourself. What does 2 Timothy 2.15 say? Study, study, study. It's a command. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed. Uh, be patient, kind, and loving. Show you care. If you're taking notes, write this down. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The lady that I work with that I shared the gospel with a couple months ago, I'm going to talk to her again. I've been praying about this and looking for an opportunity. I haven't, I haven't said anything else again, but I'm going to talk to her again because I believe the Spirit of God wants me to talk to her again. Not because I want to. I believe the Spirit of God wants me to say something else to her. But I told her, and another lady walked in. I won't go into detail, but they work together. Another lady walked in, knocked on the door. Hey, can I come in? I said, sure, come on in. So this other lady came in, who we know, and uh, sat and listened while I was talking to her. And I told her, I said, look, I care about you. I want to see you in heaven with me and her when that day comes. And I could see a change in her attitude towards what I'm sharing with her when I said that. People have to know you care about them. And so, does it matter how you act around those people all the time? It does. If we don't let the Spirit of God indwell us and work through us and let, let the love of God, that agape love, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, faithfulness, self-control, etc., flow through us towards the people around us, don't expect to be able to share the gospel with them and have them respect the words that are coming out of your mouth. You've got to show that you care about people. You, you, you've got to let the love of God be expressed through you towards other people. Sometimes just the way we live is a witness. You know, something else, Brother Paul told me, Robert, the best way to share the gospel is just tell people what Jesus has done for you. You don't have to be an expert in Scripture to do it. Just tell people what Jesus has done for you. And a lot of times we can show people that if they see there's something different in us, they're going to want to know what it is. You know, maybe I'm going through a hard time at home or maybe I'm going through a hard time at work. If people see that I'm not stressing out over it, that I'm not feeling anxious because I'm giving it all to God, they might, that might resonate with some people. That might get their attention. But you definitely, got, you definitely have got to show you care. And keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't try to be a, a scriptural expert if you're not. Keep it simple. Don't answer questions if you don't know the answer. Okay? 
Memorize key verses, and I gave you a list. Know what you believe, like, like we were talking about. Know what your faith is. And listen. Listen. Again, it's not about you. It's not about me. We're there to listen to them. You've got to be respectful of what they believe if you expect them to be respectful of what you believe. So you have to listen to them. You also have to listen to them because you're looking for clues. Looking for clues. Because what a person says to me determines what I might say next to them to help them understand what the gospel message is. And my last one, remember, it's not about you. Go to the next, next last slide. Some don'ts. Don't ever attack their beliefs. Oh, come on, really? The theory of evolution stupid. Don't do that. Don't do that. Be respectful. You know, my response is, well, you know, Darwin even said in his conclusion that, that you know, this is all great in theory, but there's probably a greater being that had something to do with all this. You know? But I don't know. I don't know. I'm not an expert on the theory of evolution. You know, that I, w I would probably have a, a response similar to that. Don't come on too strong. Don't force yourself on them. Again, let the Spirit guide you. Don't force the issue. Never force the issue. Because again, so often the Spirit of God puts you there to plant a seed, not to get a person to a salvation prayer. Just to plant a seed. Somebody else is probably going to get to enjoy seeing that person pray that salvation prayer. But God puts you in their path to plant that seed. And he may put tons of people in their path to plant seed after seed after seed after seed. That's how the Spirit of God works among people. I like that. I like that. God helped me bring curiosity to those that, what was the last, that don't know you. They don't know you. That's Ronald's prayer every morning. It's Ronald's prayer every morning. I like that. I like that a lot. I, I, think, that's, I think that's amazing. And I tell you, I think Ronald's a good example. I really do. I think Ronald's a good example of someone who, through his job, through his work as a paramedic for 30, how many, how, how long now? 32 years? He's been, and I, Ronald and I graduated high school together. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. So I've known Ronald since the seventh grade. I was, that was when I came to Hooks, was in the seventh grade. And so, I, you what now? <laughs> yeah, when you, that's true. That's true. That's true. You did. You had hair. I remember that. And um, um, Ronald, has, Ronald has a gift. He really does. He has a gift of encouragement. But I went to last year to the LifeNet Christmas party, and Ronald was being awarded what was it, the Star of Life Award. And they asked him to come up front and say something. Everything he said was giving credit to God. Everything. In front of all his coworkers. Do you think he was concerned about feeling rejected? Nope. This is how the Spirit of God works. Who do you think they have training all the new paramedics and EMTs? Why is that? So he can share the gospel with them. So he can tell them about Jesus. So he can plant seeds. And I guarantee he does that probably to everybody that's laying on his stretcher that he can think that that, that can listen if they're healthy enough to listen. So, yeah, don't force the issue. Don't assume. Don't assume a person is saved. Go ahead and share the gospel anyway. Don't debate or argue. You cannot debate a person into salvation. Don't move too fast. Don't, don't overwhelm someone with too much information too quickly. Keep it simple. And then don't ask one don't ask one don't ask someone to pray unless they are ready. 
that's where we go all the way back to letting the Spirit guide you. Okay? The worst thing you can do is steer someone to a salvation prayer when the Spirit of God's not moving among them or they don't really fully understand and they pray it and they walk away thinking they're saved and they're not. Okay? It's the worst thing you can do. How many of you have been baptized more than once? Why was that? I can tell you my personal experiences. I grew up in a little missionary Baptist church that taught me after after I believed in after I put my faith and trust in Jesus that well now Robert you got to keep your list of do's and don'ts and if you don't you're probably going to lose your salvation. I had a pre I had a pastor. I'm not lying to you. My pastor when I was a kid taught me that, Robert, when you pray, you have to confess every single sin that you have never confessed or God will not even listen to the rest of your prayer. you have any idea how much stress I was under as a teenager? I would, I would fall asleep praying, trying to think of everything I had done wrong that day. And then, of course, we had the blanket prayer. God, please forgive me for everything I can't remember. Now, is that believing in the all-sufficiency of the cross? Is that believing that what Jesus did on the cross was good enough to pay for the uh, a necessary atonement for all sin, for all man, for all time? No, it wasn't. But if you ever have the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, don't stop there. Invite them to church. Help them get plugged in somewhere because what do we all need after salvation? Discipleship. It's critical. We need discipleship. We need guidance in understanding Scripture. We need guidance in, in reading Scripture and uh, in our prayer life and understanding God to help, us, to help us grow. We have to put ourselves, be able to put ourselves in a position for God to work in us and through us and on us. And so we need that discipleship. That's, that's a critical component. So anyway, have, please have the boldness. This week, I'm going to challenge you. I always like to challenge people. This week, I want to challenge you. Identify one person. Now, I'm not saying go talk to them this week, but identify one person at work, in your family, your friends, your neighbors, identify one person that you're not certain is a believer and start praying about this. Pray and ask for God to use you to plant a seed in their life. Okay? Because if you pray about it, God's going to open your eyes to the opportunities and he's going to give you the boldness and the courage and the words to say to go share the gospel with someone and to plant some seeds. Okay? Because that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. If you're ever curious, just look through Paul's letters, look through Paul's 13 letters and count how many times he uses the word gospel. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. And that's all he did. He devoted his life to it. So I appreciate y'all tonight. Um, I didn't want to sit here and just go through a lesson in Colossians or something like that. I, Tim's doing such a magnificent job in Colossians. Um, I, can't, I can't compete with that. You know, I hope he's listening. If he is, we can all say, hi, Tim and Shannon. Come home soon. Um, Continue, again, continue to pray for them. Um, if I hear anything, I'll try to keep people posted. But um, from what I've heard today, I think things are looking good. So I appreciate y'all sticking around for listening to me for an hour and 15 minutes, and I will let you go. Thank you. <laughs>